Um, in the morning session, um, Jeffrey talked, is this, did I get this on? Yes. Yeah. Can, you can hear me? Okay, good. All right. So in the morning session, Jeffrey talked about, you know, finding kind of these untapped markets for teaching. And so you can have a new topic, but you can also find a new audience if you're looking for more teaching, that is. Um, some of you may not be looking for additional teaching. Um, and so like many, I started out in the traditional economics um, curriculum. And then, um, and I taught undergraduates uh, health economics. And some of my favorite students were actually the pre-med students. I loved teaching them. I loved the economics students too. They were <laughs> economic students <laughs> going into a pre-med track. Um, and so when I found myself in a college of medicine, um, I was really interested in teaching health economics to med school students because it turns out that medical students get no information whatsoever about the industry they're going to operate in. Not even basic stuff like, how's Medicaid different from Medicare? I mean, really fundamental stuff they don't get. And so I contacted my former undergrads who were in different med schools around the country and I said, hey, what do you think about this idea? And there were two takeaways. One was they like, yeah, super important, every med school student should have this. And the second was, no way you can do it in the first two years during the core curriculum because there's so much other stuff and they won't appreciate it. So I met with the senior associate dean and so we said, well, let's do a four, fourth year medical education elective. Um, and these are two week electives and this can be one of the ones that they rotate through. And so we did that and I had a pretty small enrollment. Um, and then I also um, developed a similar course for our junior honors medical program, which was for um, third year undergraduates who were, they picked 12 each year, um, who can, who get into an accelerated BSMD program. And again, small enrollment elective. Um, and so then we had a new senior associate dean come through um, to the college, who's still there, um, Dr. Joe Fantone, and he led a major review and revision of the curriculum with lots of student and faculty input. And one of the priorities I, areas identified was um, health systems, health economics. And actually, we also have a competency-based curriculum. And one of the areas is systems-based practice. Good area for health economics, right? Um, so now I'm teaching a required course for 140 first-year medical students. I completely lost my favorable selection bias. <laughs> I used to think I was a good teacher until I started teaching this course. And all the courses, they were all oriented towards aspiring physicians. So the aims are common. We're right? giving them this foundational information on our health systems, um, and then helping them make connections to patient care. So again, making it relevant for your population. Um, helping them identify resources that are reliable, usable and accessible to them, um, and then integrating the content within the context of the broader curriculum, super important, and then having very applied approaches to learning, and then using a variety of strategies um, to accomplish that. And so I could talk about the first two courses, which were tremendously fun to teach. I had bright, engaged students who chose to take the course. Um, that was really easy. It's more interesting, I think, to talk about the challenge here. And so these were the challenges. And the first was exactly what my former students said. It's competing with the real stuff, right? And so we had to deal with that. And then, you know, again, you know, you come into it as economists. We're a kind of dative, quantitative driven thing. And even recognizing that I've worked with lots of non-economists before, I took out all kinds of data and statistics. Still too many statistics. Still too many statistics. Because what they care about is how is this going to help them with patient care? They're med school students. They're going to be physicians. This is what matters. And they also want to know, they really want to make a difference. So these were things that we had to think about. So the first challenge was to get out that competing element. And so we developed it as a one-week intensive course. And I have the word intensive in quotes because originally they were called intercessions, which the students interpreted as vacation. <laughs> so, and that's really not what the goal was. Um, so we changed it to intensive. And it took a while before we got the timing of this one week right. Right now it's right after they come back from the winter holiday. Um, so we can talk about and we can teach and study health systems and health economics for years. As a matter of fact, I think that's what we all do. I have five days. 
And actually, this year I had four days because Monday was a holiday. <laughs> um, so it really makes you focus on what is that core content. And this is also something our senior associate dean really emphasizes. He does not want med school students getting tons of content just being pushed at them. He wants every course to focus on what's foundational and have them really get it. So he doesn't want more than a third of that contact time being lectures. He wants lots of applications. Um, and so even when we're doing lectures, you know, we incorporate things like audience response. And we do use, one of the audience response I like to do is use the Kaiser Family Foundation poll questions and compare their responses to what um, the public is responding. Um, discussion breakouts, um, video clips. Um, we have a lot of uh, group activities, including a three-hour um, team-based learning activity around ethics and health policy. And I'm going to talk about some of these other pieces. So this is a sample in class, one of the interactive lecture activities that we have. And this is my actual slide from class. So when you see this blue bar, this is actually what the students are getting in class. And so the fact that this is about the third or fourth time now that we're talking about AFPs and adverse selection, I think it speaks to the centrality of this. And for me, it's very reaffirming because going into a class with med students and saying, okay, we're going to talk about actually a fair premiums, which actually is not the right way to do it, um, is it's, it's, it's reinforcing to know everybody thinks this is pretty central if you want to understand our systems of care in the U.S., understand insurance markets, individual mandate, all these different things that we talk about policy-wise. Um, so before now, but I don't even say actuarially fair premium when I, before I do this. I just give them a very simple example. And everybody's got an equal chance of getting sick. Here's how much it's going to cost. How much should everybody pay? And would you be willing to pay that? Have them talk about it. It seems pretty straightforward. And then I say, well, let's make it similar interesting, right? It's still very simple. Every, the, not everybody has the same chance. I just change it a little bit. Now how much should everybody pay? And would you be willing to pay for that? And then would you have been willing to pay what you figured out in the, the first example? And so, you know, of course, when you change the likelihood of getting sick and you have different, different risks, you know, you get some groups that say when they come back to the larger group and we say, okay, report out, you know, what you came up with and why. Um, you get some say everybody should pay the same amount and some groups that say, oh, people should pay different amounts. So then you can talk about community rating and experience rating. And in the first example, when they come up with the amount paid, that gets you right into the actuarially fair premium. And we had one group last year where one guy said, well, if I'm selling it, I'm going to charge more than that. And you can talk about loading costs. Um, and so, and then it also sets the stage for talking about voluntary markets, death spirals, mandates, and all that stuff. And so we do this and then introduce the concepts that they relate to. Um, and you get a lot, and even this one, sometimes like you think you know what they're going to come back with. This past year they were super creative and they had really interesting ideas about how people should pay and why they should pay that way. And it was a lot of fun to do the discussion. Um, so the big issue that you can absolutely not do enough of is connect things to how does it matter for patient care. Um, and so I'm going to focus on the items that have the check marks. If you're interested in talking about some of the other things, I'd be happy to talk with you. Um, this is the space that I teach in, so I'm super fortunate and lucky. Take this, take pictures, take it back to your deans, and say this is what you want. Um, so these screens up here, um, these screens up here, the students can show what's in their laptops. So if I had you do breakouts, I could set it up so that you could show what's on your computer screen on those screens up there. Great for reporting back. Best space ever. Um, and so, again, the timing of the course, so my first link to their patient care is the very first thing I do before I talk about the syllabus, the course requirements, I maybe introduce myself first, that's it. And so the timing is, is, you know, they've got their fall classes, then they have their first clinical experience the first two weeks in December, winter break, two weeks off, and then they have my course. So they haven't seen each other, they've had their preceptorships and haven't seen each other yet for a month. And so the first thing I do is I have them sit at the tables where they're sitting and talk about their preceptor experiences with each other, but from a healthcare systems perspective. And then we have some groups report out and we have a discussion and that really frames and motivates the course. So this is what I actually have them do. And, and the things I ask them to kind of talk about in their groups. 
And one of the things that was surprising to me the first time I did this was because I'm always thinking, you know, a lot of times physicians don't have a good sense of what their patient's coverage is. And the students actually had a really good sense of what types of coverage the patients had, which I was surprised about. And, the, and I said, well, how did, you come, how did you come to gain this knowledge? And they said, well, when we were helping to make determinations about which prescriptions to do and what referrals to make, it mattered what coverage they had. Wow, does that really help frame the course or what? And so that, that, that type of thing really helps set the stage for, for why the course matters and how it can be useful to them. Another activity that's been really well received, if you, how many people are familiar with the PBS video Money in Medicine? Um, oh, a, I, fewer people than have taught med school students. These are unexpected findings. And so <laughs> this is a great documentary. It's a little long, um, but it, it illustrates different delivery systems, um, models of delivery, you know, the effects of fee-for-service and other types of reimbursement on the amount of care provision, you know, effective care use. But it's really good for health professionals, medical students, because it talks about evidence-based medicine, which they start learning, you know, the very first term. Um, it, and it shows physician-patient interactions, physicians explaining different treatment options and so forth. Um, so it's a really good um, documentary. I highly recommend it. And, and it gets into ethical issues, too. I mean, it covers kind of the gamut in a very nice way. And so they have established collaborative um, learning groups with faculty facilitation. So they watch the video before, and I provide, I provide guides with all the information they need, and I include um, discussion questions. Now, it turns out that once they've seen the documentary, it's very rare that the groups aren't ready to talk. Um, so they usually don't need the discussion questions, but they have them in advance so they can start thinking about these types of issues. And again, these are the ones that I include for them. And um, they, they're available there for the faculty facilitator or the students to use if there were to be a lull in the discussion. My sense from the faculty leaders is that you know, they usually are rolling and they, everybody enjoys um, these discussions and they're very useful. Um, the last activity that I wanted to talk about is a group project. And I, I use group projects in almost all of my courses. Um, and from the prior uh, two courses that I described a while um, earlier, um, I just had kind of like a standard project where you assign or they pick a topic and they do it. And I started that initially with the med school students. And it was like okay, but it wasn't great. And who wants to be okay? And so, you know, it's always going back to how do you connect it to patient care? So I developed um, patient scenarios. Some of these are different because some of the patient scenarios that I developed initially didn't work. Um, these seem to be working pretty well. And you can see we've got different ages, different types of coverage, different health conditions, and different types of barriers and challenges to accessing care. Um, and so um, they approach it, they use those collaborative learning groups of eight students, and they approach it from both the patient and the provider perspective. So part of what we want them to think about is, you know, how are those perspectives similar and different? Um, so they can look at it through both lenses, because certainly you want your physician thinking about things from the patient perspective as well. Project development is pretty standard stuff. So what I really want to talk about was kind of the deliverable. What do they do at the end? And this was another one of those things where it took a little bit of figuring out. So initially, I had them doing panel presentations to the rest of the class. And each of the groups is assigned one of those scenarios. Um, so there's multiple groups covering a scenario. And the student feedback was they really wanted to be presenting it in smaller groups and have more interaction. And keep in mind, I have 140 students. And so I'm sitting here going, uh, well, yeah, that would be nice. Let me work on it. And so it's actually our associate dean, um, Dr. Novak, who's wonderful. And she and I were kind of just talking about this. She said, well, what about a gallery walk? Now, how many people are familiar with gallery walks? Not many. And I wasn't either. And I said, sure. And I always agree to stuff without actually knowing what I'm agreeing to. <laughs> I had like a vague idea. And I thought, you know, I can Google anything, right? So um, I tried it. And, and I liked it. And the students liked it. It was really cool. And so um, I'll give you the resource in a minute that I use for this. But basically, the way it works is they're moving through stations, and they do um, three stations in um, an hour. We allow 15 minutes per station and then a little bit of time to transition. And so there's two people who stay with their presentation. And you can actually visualize it, right? So in this room, you can think about four stations here using the two, the 
fire hand most um, panels. And so the groups here, two members stay here and they're presenting to six other students from another group who are doing the walking around that circle. And so the presenters are doing three presentations each um, to six of their peers and they give a short presentation. They are asked to pose a question for peer feedback um, and then um, when they're done with that short interaction, the ones who are walking um, give peer review on a sheet of paper. Um, and so that's kind of how it works. Um, I can give you more details if you're interested in it, but they get that small interaction, good discussion. And then after that, they have an hour where they debrief on the peer feedback and they develop questions for an expert panel. The expert panel is comprised of clinical faculty with um, background, varied backgrounds that are relevant to the area, so pediatrician, emergency medicine physician, be it a public health dentist. Um, and during the lunch hour, I kind of organize and order those questions, and then I call on the groups, they briefly present their patient and question to the expert panel. It's a really nice way um, to end the course. Um, they get this feedback from the expert panel. Um, and that's just what it looks like for the students. And this is a resource I used for developing the gallery walk, um, which was very helpful. Um, with the assessment, one of the, and this is done for all the med school courses, but what's cool about it is there's a student-led committee that actually reviews all the evaluations, and they develop an agenda for a debriefing meeting where they um, give you feedback on what they thought went well and opportunities for improvement. Um, we're still working on some different things, but um, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, wrap this up. And then these are just the acknowledgments of all the wonderful people who helped to make this five-day course work. Um, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards, and um, please feel free to email us with any questions. Thank you so much. In the, whole, in the whole course? Yes. Um, so there's multiple components to the evaluation. There's a quiz at the, um, a quiz at the end of the course. It's individual. Um, in their small group works, we get feedback from their faculty leaders. I have them fill out an assessment form of the extent to which they were prepared, they participated, they were engaged. Um, we, um, they submit their project to me, and they also indicate who, like a peer-reviewed paper, they indicate who made what contributions to the project. Um, and I, I have them, I say, you know, when we submit a paper, we have to say who did what. So when you do this project, you gotta say who did what. Um, and so that type of thing. And then um, they're doing group work and stuff in class too, so there's a lot of observation. Um, and so you get a pretty good picture of what's going on. And then the quiz at the end kind of does a knowledge piece um, of it. And if people perform below the um, threshold for the quiz, um, then they have, they, there's a remediation assignment, which is pretty in-depth that they do to make sure that they really are getting it. Yeah. 